Pete, if the chair would like to kick us off. Mark, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? There, there we, we go. go. We got you now. Okay. Okay. Got that, but no uh, no video no uh, video on here. And yeah, I had to go off my browser. The the link was not working. And just in case anybody else has that problem. Um, so first of all, who do we um, who do we have here? Or you know what? Let's just go and do. Uh, let's call it to order. At uh, you know, I got five after, and then we'll do uh, um, introductions around just so we know who's who's there. And, and I heard somebody say we had a quorum, but anyway, so I am present, I guess, Mark Larkin for the GUAC. And Chairman Larkin, this is Kyle uh, from the from DWR. Your camera is on; we can see you, so you should be all good to go. Okay, well, I'll be careful then, because <laughs> yeah, I can't see any of you guys. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. If the GUAC members could please introduce themselves, we'll start that process. Uh, this is Gary Brasher. I'm I'm present. Alejandro Barcenas, I'm present. Joel Kramer, I'm present. <clears throat> and is that it? Anybody? Um, I guess Ron's not there. No, it looks like Ron is not in the meeting currently, but if he joins, we'll make an announcement. Okay, okay, so we do have a quorum because we have four then, so we're, we're good. Um, so anyway, um, so um, DWR staff, if, um, yeah, if you go ahead and introduce yourselves, please. Who's here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Kyle Miller. I am the AMA director in charge of program implementation. Kennedy Shepard, GUAC coordinator. Brad Niska, industrial program data specialist. Jenna Norris, Governor's Water Council coordinator. Um, Amanda Long, AMA planning manager. Madison Moreno, the municipal data specialist. Uh, and my name is Natalie Mast. I'm the AMA director responsible for the management plans and planning. Okay, great. And um, I didn't hear anybody. Is Sandy? Is Sandy there? Yes, she is. She's just inept at getting to her mute button. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, um, so yeah, because somebody, a couple people got muted. Um, but what I've got on the list is I've got, uh, you know, um, Kennedy's there, Jenna. Um, Sandy, Natalie, Amanda, and then of course Kyle. Did I miss anybody? Mr. Chair, we also have Brad Nisco here. He's also on the agenda and, and we'll be talking oh, okay. a little later. And, okay. Madison, and Madison Moreno. Um, so anyway, yeah. Nothing. I'll do no. So um, I guess uh, Kennedy, if you want to get us with the webinar, and just so you guys know, your voices are kind of coming in and out. I don't know if mine's doing the same or not, but it's having a little trouble here. Yeah, we're having a little trouble um, hearing you sometimes as well, but um, we're going to go ahead with the webinar logistics. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just want to cover some bases before we get the meeting started. Um, we do ask that members of the public please keep your phone muted during the meeting. This helps with audio feedback. If you have any questions or comments throughout the meeting, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We will address them at the end of each presentation. 
If you would like to speak to the council, to call to the public will be your time to do so. This meeting is being recorded and once WebEx has finished generating it, it will be posted to ADWR's website. And of course, if you're having any technical difficulties, our help desk is available to you. Their contact information is on the screen. And that's all I have, thank you. Then, uh, do you have, Kennedy, do you have uh, updates from the uh, web page? I know that what got sent out is there have been some updates to the web page. And um, so, if there's just some things you want to go over and let us know, please do so. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so we have a few updates. Um, we'll go over the ones that we sent out later under the management plans presentation, but for concerning the GUACs, if you're on our, uh, the GUAC webpage on our website, you'll see at the very bottom, um, we've made access to all of the previous GUAC meetings um, more available or easily available, I should say. Um, so as you can see here, you can filter by year, you can easily access the agenda, any meeting, materials, and you can see all the past GUAC meetings. So we just added that in there to add more um, convenience to the council members and to members of the public. Okay, thanks. And um, yeah, like you said, the other ones that, that go with the management plan and the links on there, we can cover those later. Okay, um, election of officers. I'm certainly willing, well, I would be, you know, willing to continue on as chairman or if somebody else has any kind of burning desire where they would like to be chairman, um, I would certainly defer to them. So, um, you know, or if we want to swap it off, if, if we want, you know, Gary to, to move up, you know, and just, just kind of rotate everybody through. Um, I'm, I'm good with that. So I'm just going to ask the uh, um, members, you know, Gary and Alejandro and, and Joel, what, uh, what do you all think? I'm okay with you staying. Uh, if uh, there's need to rotate, I think the more senior in the, in the board should be the next one. Um, well, we can do, is anybody more senior to like you and me, Alejandro? I think we've been, we've been at this. We've grown old at this. Okay, yeah. Uh, but uh, I guess the members of the board that have been sitting on the board longer than anybody else, I think would be good. Well, that'd be, uh, th this, yeah. This is Gary. And, and if you're willing to serve and given your historic knowledge of, you know, obviously the issues and, and that kind of thing, I, I would certainly be a supporter of, of, uh, of that. If, if, you know, if you're willing to consider continuing on. Okay, well, and because I'm thinking the other senior guy is, uh, or the most senior guy is probably Ron, um, yeah. which it would serve him right if we made him chairman since he didn't show up, you know, for this, <laughs> this meeting. That would be nice. Yeah. We, you know, <laughs> um, we could do that and just surprise him. But I'll tell you, <laughs> just in the interest of move, moving on here, so. I'll make a motion, even as, as chairman, I usually don't, is I'll make a motion, I guess, at the board that uh, we just, when's the next step? Does this come up once a year or every two years? Can somebody from DWR let me know? Yeah, this is every two years. So every even year we'll do the elections. Okay. I think you should continue, Mark. Um, okay, you know what? I'll make a motion that we just keep the board uh, the way it is and the officers, the way they are. Somebody wants to second that. Yeah, I'll second that, Mark. It's Gary. Okay. Okay. And then, so all, all in favor of that signify by, I, I don't know how we do that. We don't have pictures here. Um, I, well, I'll, I'll do a call. Okay. So we'll do it this way. Gary, you said, you said, I, I, uh, Alejandro. I, 
Okay, uh, Joel. Aye. Okay, uh, motion carries. Okay, next thing we want is, um, okay, Jenna, on the um, agenda, you are up next on the GW AICC updates. Great. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Council. Um, so my name is Jenna Norris, and as I stated earlier, I coordinate the Governor's Water Augmentation, Innovation, and Conservation Council, which I will hear and refer to as just the Governor's Water Council. Uh, thank you for having me, and I'm going to share with you all an update on some of what the Council's been up to in the past few months. Kennedy. So I thought I would share with um, the Council webpage as it's a really good resource to find anything and everything related to the Council, including and um, documents that the Council has produced. So I think Kennedy is working on getting that web page pulled up for you guys. One moment. Okay, so if you go to meetings on the right-hand navigation pane, it's actually set up very similar to how the new GUAC website is set up. So there's all of the meetings of both the council and its four committees um, on this page, as well as all of the slide decks and meeting recordings, and you can filter this by a particular committee. So if you wanted to look at just the salination committee meetings, for example, um, you could apply that filter. And then uh, the other helpful web page on here, I think, is this documents page, also on the right-hand navigation pane, where it's um, sorted by which committee produced the document. And so, for example, if you were interested in reading the uh, annual report of the council, you could scroll up and filter to the GWAKE, as the acronym goes, and that would have all of the annual reports, so the 2021, 2020, and we are actually working on 2022 annual report right now. So I wanted to show you all of that. Um, contact information and calendar and everything is on there as well. So moving on. Kennedy. Uh, this slide shows the agenda from the last council meeting, which was on November 30th of last year. The meeting recording is also linked on the slide for your convenience. Chairman Director Vishopki started off the meeting with a Colorado River update, in which the director shared information about the 1030 consultation and the resulting 500 plus plan. The chair then shared an update on the discussion of additional management plans. And finally, committee shared updates with the council. Uh, the majority of my presentation is about those committee updates and what they have been up to. So I will elaborate on that in my next few slides. I did want to point out that the next meeting of the council on March 25th has been canceled due to the water intensive legislative session that is still underway. The non-AMA groundwater committee met ahead of that November council meeting on October 14th and has also met since on January 6th. At the October 14th committee meeting, Representative Griffin shared a summary of the 2021 legislative accomplishments, which was followed by a presentation on enhanced recharge from Keith Nelson, who's the ADWR senior research hydrologist, and Nick Hunt, who is retired director of development services for Mojave County, and I believe also a um, acting engineer on contract with Mojave County currently. Keith recapped the presentation that he had given to the Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee in August, and Nick presented on Mojave County Stormwater Infiltration Program, summarizing many of the constructed and planned projects that they have going on up there. Members also discussed and revisited the committee's goals, um, and the committee participants, along with co-chair Jamie Kelly, stated a desire for further discussions on water management strategies at subsequent meetings. So at the January 6th meeting, Jamie Kelly posed to the committee, 
what are the various possible objectives, goals, and needs for additional groundwater management in rural areas, and then shared a series of slides summarizing the various choices for potential groundwater management structures and tools. Following her presentation, Carol Ward, Deputy Assistant Director here at the department, shared an overview of the available and existing voluntary options and tools to exist water availability as well. There was a robust discussion by committee members about forming a subcommittee um, to explore rural groundwater management strategies, but ultimately there was not a consensus on that, and so a subcommittee was not formed. The Long-Term Water Augmentation Committee um, had not met ahead of the November 30th Council meeting, but they have met since on January 13th, during which they heard a series of presentations on weather modification and cloud control. Jennifer Heim, ADWR Deputy Council, presented on the existing statutes governing weather modification projects in the state, sharing the gaps in the current statutes and the questions those gaps mm -hmm. give rise to. Catherine Rydell, Community Water Systems Coordinator, compared the various regulatory requirements and provisions for those states that do have weather modification laws. And then finally, James Walter of SRP <coughs> presented a timeline of breakthroughs in weather modification and cloud seeding, also sharing an update on the White Mountains Research Project, which is a feasibility study being conducted by the Desert Research Institute um, and funded through a multitude of partnerships Committee meeting ended with a discussion facilitated by Chair Wade Noble on the potential for the committee to develop a long-term water augmentation plan sometime in the future. Next slide. This is our last committee, so I, I thank you for bearing with me. The post-2025 AMA committee was very busy leading up to that November 30th council meeting. They had met three times on October 5th, October 27th, and November 9th. At the October 5th meeting, they heard a presentation from Ron Doba of NAMWA on the findings and draft recommendations of the Prescott AMA Exempt 12 study group. This meeting was followed by a robust discussion, and those recommendations are posted on the council webpage as well as linked on the slide for your convenience. At both the October 27th and at the November 9th meeting, the committee discussed the 2021 package of proposals. Those discussions were robust, spirited, and productive. The committee co-chairs co determined that proposed potential solutions, which met three defined criteria, would ultimately brought, be brought forward to the council. The criteria were ideas that address more than one challenge, have overall committee support, and are politically viable in 2022, considering ADWR and legislative leadership. With that, at the November 30th Council, the post-2025 co-chairs brought forward a package of five proposals, which included ideas for potential legislation, rules, policy, as well as recommendations for ADWR um, reviews. In that list is also an additional list of ideas for potential further exploration in 2022 and beyond. That package of proposals is posted to the website and linked on this slide. I know that was a lot of information, so thank you again uh, for having me. That concludes my update. If you have any questions related to anything I shared today or anything to do with the council, my contact information is on this slide, as well as Nadine Hubbard, who's the newest member of our team, and our manager, John Riggins. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Do we have any questions from the council? Oh, and I should say, yeah, thank you, Jenna, but do we have any questions from the council on that? I'm good. <laughs> okay. Um, just a, a question is if, um, if we go on the site and we're looking at those uh, is is your contact information, is there a way, not necessarily interactive or something, but is there a, uh, you know, like a contact us or your contact information also on the uh, on the site if as we're, you know, looking over the, uh, the information there, if we have any questions? 
Yes, so if you go on the council website, my information is on there, my email and my phone number. And actually, the, um, that's a timely question because the council uh, program, you know, I'm a program coordinator for the council essentially, and that's all housed under statewide planning, which also houses rural programs and um, community water systems, et cetera. We just created on the statewide planning website for ADWR a new contact form where you can submit questions and it will be sent to all of us to a statewide planning email address. Um, so uh, you can either reach out to me directly or you can also reach out to that statewide planning at azwater.gov. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Me, anything else? Any more questions for Jenna on there? I'm good. Okay. You're the same guy who was good last time. So, okay. Um, so on to the, um, the, big, the big issue here, the fifth management plan, which just lets us know how long some of us have been doing this. Um, so uh, Natalie, if um, I've got you listed first as the draft management uh, plan presenter. So you can take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I appreciate uh, you all having me here today. Um, let me just make sure I can see the slides and everything here. Good. Um, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the council, uh, thank you for having me. I, as you said, as I introduced myself earlier, my name is Natalie Mast. I'm the AMA director responsible for the management plans. And I'm very excited to say that we've published a draft of the fifth management, uh, a draft fifth management plan for the Santa Cruz AMA. Uh, my colleagues and I are here to discuss that plan and also to request your comments on that draft today. So we are going to cover a lot of ground today. So um, in the interest of time, I do ask that you hold any questions or comments to the end, uh, at which time we'd be happy to flip back to the earlier slides and dashboards and, and such as needed. Um, so first here, I will provide an overview of the fifth management plan. Then I will hand it over to Amanda, Brad, and Madison, who will walk us through our new data dashboards. Um, after that, Sandy Favorites will provide a, an overview of, the, of a proposal to add an alternative mining program to the fifth management plan. And then I will return to provide some information on the process going forward. So that's a lot. Um, and at that point, uh, I will hand things back over to you, Mr. Chair, and to the council for any questions and discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the Groundwater Management Act, uh, all of you, I am sure, are familiar with this at this point, so I'm not going to uh, belabor this. But I, I really wanted to emphasize here that a lot has changed since the Groundwater Management Act was passed in 1980. But the AMAs in the state of Arizona as a whole are really undoubtedly in a stronger and more resilient position because of this law and because of the actions that we've taken to work toward the goals set forth um, under that act. Uh, next slide, please. The act set forth a variety of requirements. Uh, it created the initial AMAs, established a series of five management plans for those AMAs, um, and those plans were designed to be incremental. Uh, gradually increasing conservation requirements over time to help each AMA move toward its management goal. The management goal for Santa Cruz being to maintain safe yield and to prevent the decline of local water tables. Um, and the way that the management plans uh, help each AMA move toward its goal or maintain its goal is by reducing withdrawals of groundwater. The plan we're discussing today is the fifth management plan, which is the last in that series of plans laid out by the, the Groundwater Management Act. Assuming that we meet the adoption timeline that I will lay out later in the presentation, the requirements in the fifth management plan will go into effect on January 1st, 2025, and will remain in effect until the legislature determines otherwise. Excuse me. Next slide, please. 
We began the process to develop the fifth management plans in mid 2019. Uh, in order to do that, we conducted a extensive and extensive stakeholder process working with folks across the AMAs and across sectors to develop conservation programs for the fifth management plans that were responsive to stakeholder concerns and would function to reduce withdrawals of groundwater. Over the course of the last year, we worked to put those concepts into draft regulatory language and to draft the narrative to support those requirements. We intend to spend much of this year working through the legal adoption or promulgation process for the fifth management plan for HAMA. Next slide, please. The draft fifth management plan was published to ADWR's website on January 31st. The management plans webpage also links to low water use plants lists, uh, supplement one, which lists allotment data for each agricultural right, and to a report that was also published on January 31st that details the method for analyzing safe, safe yield and discusses the status of each AMA with regard to its goal. Next slide. One of our major goals for the fifth management plans was to streamline these documents. Much of that streamlining could be achieved by referring to supplemental information rather than including extensive detail within the plan. Uh, for example, rather than extensively detailing geologic structures and hydrologic conditions, we point to the most recent model report. This both allows the management plan to be streamlined and also ensures that the reader is directed to the most up-to-date information available. This was particularly important for the fifth management plan due to the indefinite timeline of this plan. By streamlining, we were also able to condense the document from 11 chapters from the fourth management plan to eight chapters here. We also added an executive summary, which provides a brief overview of the document and helps point the reader to the detail throughout. Next slide, please. Another way we streamlined the document was moving much of the data online. Previous plans had extensive data tables printed in the document, but those tables were unable to be corrected if errors were found and couldn't be updated with additional years of data over time. The growth of interactive online tools has allowed us to move much of that previously static data online, allowing us to provide additional detail and to improve our transparency by making more of our data more readily available. In addition to interactive tools and downloadable data on our data page, we also published a comprehensive report, which includes a description of the aspects of the safe of safe yield, how ADWR analyzes those aspects, and the status of each AMA with regard to its management goal. I, I had mentioned this uh, report on a previous slide. We're really proud of the work done there, and we do plan to present more information about this report at a future GUAC meeting. The results of these structural updates for the plan, though, is a plan that is more accessible it's easier to navigate and it has data and references that will remain updated despite the indefinite timeline of the fifth management plan. Next slide, please. In addition to uh, the structural changes, the fifth management plan also contains significant updates to the conservation requirements. We began the development process for the five MPs with in person meetings in mid 2019 but moved to an online only format in early 2020 due to the pandemic. In order to address some of the challenges of holding these types of meetings online, we developed an, excuse me, a number of strategies, excuse me. Um, we developed a number of strategies, including, excuse me, goodness, including use of the chat function in our online meetings, pauses in the meetings to allow time for people to type questions or speak up, and online questionnaires for additional questions or feedback after the meeting. Um, and we also developed uh, the 5MP concepts page that you can see on your screen. 
The concepts page was developed as an effort at transparency and, and improved communication, providing a one stop location for quick summaries about each of the proposals we were developing for the five MPs data about those proposals. References to meetings where those proposals were discussed and stakeholder comments about those proposals. Eventually, we added draft regulatory language for each of the proposals to this website. This page is still available and now functions as an overview of the updates made for the five MPs and allows stakeholders to explore some of the history of the development and the rationale for development for each of the five MP conservation programs. We've talked about many of these items in previous meetings, but I'll provide a quick overview today as well. Uh, next slide, please. Excuse me. In the recharge chapter, there was language related to the storage of water in areas with shallow depths of water that was originally added to the third management plans. This language had not previously been enforced, at least partially due to a lack of clarity about what shallow meant. In order to be transparent about how that language would be enforced, the draft language for the 5MP has been expanded to include a definition of shallow as 50 feet or less below land surface and to allow for a report which will define the areas within the AMA deemed to be shallow, allowing us to both narrow and update determines of determinations of those areas over time. ADWR has heard some stakeholder feedback regarding the need for additional clarity on this definition. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and we are working with stakeholders to add some clarifying language that would uh, indicate possible criteria in addition to that 50 foot indicator. Um, including considerations for mounting around recharge facilities for shallow water and riparian areas and for areas where dewatering or drainage activities are occurring. Ultimately, the goal is to avoid adding additional water to areas that are already shallow and to protect that water that is being stored. We have now posted updated regulatory language on our 5MP concepts page. And we intend to incorporate that updated language into the 5MP drafts as we begin the promulgation process for each AMA. All of that said, though, there are not currently any permitted recharge facilities in the Santa Cruz AMA. In the Ag chapter, the updates are broader. Uh, the default conservation program for Ag is what we call the base program. It's, this is an allotment based program based on historic acreages and historically grown crops. For this program, statute allows a 5% reduction of the top 25% of water duties within a series of limitations. For the BMP program, which is an optional alternative program, its extensive updates were made to the list of BMPs and minimum points requirements for several categories were updated. These updates were made in collaboration and with the recommendation of the BMP advisory committees chaired by Scott Riggins. And similar to the recharge facilities, we do not actually have any BMP participants in the Santa Cruz AMA at this time. Uh, finally, for ag, there is an additional optional alternative for the fifth management plan. Um, which allows someone farming multiple IGFRs to combine the allotments of those IGFRs with a 5% cut to the aquifer, enabling that person to submit a single annual report and to use some of that uh, to use that combined allotment anywhere across the combined footprint of those IGFRs, encouraging the use of the water on the most efficient lands. Next slide, please. In the municipal chapter, we again have multiple programs. The major updates were to the programs for large municipal providers or those supplying more than 250 acre feet of water for non irrigation use. The APCD program is the default program for large providers who have a designation of assured water supply and providers who are not designated may not participate in the GPCD program. 
The 5MP draft language contains an updated calculation for the GPCD requirement, which uses a rolling average of the provider's historic GPCD to calculate the provider's target. The calculation functions to apply downward pressure to a provider's GPCD, allowing for a number that is customized to that provider, can reasonably be achieved, and reflects reductions in withdrawals of groundwater through that downward pressure on GPCDs over time. The non per capita program is a BMP style program for large municipal providers. Designated providers may opt into this program and undesignated providers are required to be in this program. Significant updates were made to the BMP list for this program and updates were made to the points, targets and tiers for this program. In the industrial chapter, uh, several subsectors also have updates. For power plants, a minor update allows for a modification to be made for uh, to cycles of concentration requirements. If blow down water, <laughs> excuse me, goodness, I apologize. Um, if blow down water will be beneficially reused. For golf courses, the method for calculating conservation allotments was redesigned to better reflect overseeding practices and more recent consumptive use analyses. For non-golf turf facilities, the allotment calculation was split into um, a less generous uh, a less generous calculation for facilities with greater than 30% water intensive landscape and a more generous calculation for facilities with less than or equal to 30% water intensive landscape. This is designed to incentivize those with more efficient types of landscapes and includes a provision to it includes a provision to provide consideration for parks and schools where additional turf may have functional purposes like sports fields. Next slide please. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, in addition to the updates to the conservation requirements, the draft 5MP just simply looks different than previous plans. We've worked to streamline, move things into interactive online formats, and we've also worked to add information about how folks can participate and be engaged. These GUAC meetings are one way that people can be engaged. Um, Jenna talked earlier about the council and the opportunity for engagement there. And AMA staff are available by phone and email for one on one support, whether it be a specific annual report question, a question about his <coughs> historical data, or an idea for improvement. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that all said, the transparency and data availability improvements are one of the things we're most proud of in all of this. So with that, I will give my voice a break here, <laughs> excuse me, uh, and I'll hand things off to Amanda to inter introduce the sector dashboards. Thank you, Natalie. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Larkin and members of the council. Thank you. Um, my name again is Amanda Long, and I'm the AMA planning manager. And along with two of our data specialists, Brad and Madison, will be walking you through um, the sector data dashboards. Um, so, as Natalie mentioned, the data dashboards were created um, for each sector agricultural, industrial, and municipal as a supplement to the fifth management plans and to support our uh, data transparency efforts in general. In the past, data included in the management plans were static and did not cover the entire management period, and the data within the plans itself were quite difficult to update. So for the fifth management plan, we've removed a lot of the data within the plan itself into these interactive dashboards. So these dashboards can be updated every year with additional data and include what's most up to date and allow the user to filter to the information that they are most interested in. So the dashboards are located on the AMA data page, which is here, uh, and there are several drop-downs, including uh, the three sectors that we're going to walk through today. 
So I'm going to start here with the agricultural program. So you um, open the dashboard through the drop-down, and then there's the option to, you could work with it in, within here, or you um, can expand the dashboard as well. So this one's the agricultural dashboard, as I said. Um, there's seven pages, so I'll kind of walk you through each of them. We'll start with the first page, which shows irrigation acres over time, and then water demand by type over time. Um, and the filters on the side allow you to um, filter that data by year and then by AMA. So for example, I'll click on Santa Cruz, um, and, and you can also filter by water type as well. So the second page shows information similar um, to the second graph on the first page, but it allows you to filter that information by right. So you can type in the right that you are interested in and click on it and see data for that specific right. And then on the left, you can um, filter that information by, by year. Um, it also shows the allotment um, and irrigation acres for that specific right. And then on this page as well, there's uh, some links to some useful information. So the first is to our annual reports page, um, which allows you to look for historical information. Excuse me just a second. I'm trying to go back to our previous page. Right behind it. Yeah, it's just there. You go. Trying to get far. Uh -uh. Here, if you just go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We're just having difficulty moving a bar that's covering the page that I'd like to get to. Like directly behind it. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Um, and the second link, which I'm now not going to open, just in case, um, just leads to our uh, groundwater rights map where you can look up information on, or you can look up your IGFR. Uh, the third page of the dashboard shows the flexibility accounts for, for the IGFR. So again, you can search by individual right. And that will give you information on that specific right, as well as you can filter that information by year. And it also shows um, the AMA that the IGFR is in, the sub-basin, and then the irrigation district. And on this page, too, there is a link to um, a web page where you can look for flex credits that are by, on sale by irrigation district. This fourth page shows um, water supply by water type. And this one allows you to filter by irrigation district and by year as well. So um, if you pick a specific irrigation district, it will show you the water type for that one for that year. This next page is related to the best management plan, the best management practices program, um, which is an alternative conservation program for the agricultural sector. And this one shows the BMPs that are being implemented by category. So this page is for category three, and then the next page is um, for category four. And again, you can filter that information by year um, and by AMA. Um, Santa Cruz is not listed here because there are no participants in the BMP program in the Santa Cruz AMA. However, if um, someone did join, uh, we could um, update this data to, to look at that. And then the final page is um, just a list of definitions that um, are relevant to the dashboard. Um, so with that, that is the agricultural dashboard, and I will pass this over to Brad, who will show you the industrial one. Hey, good afternoon, council members of the chair. Uh, again, my name is Brad Niska. I'm the industrial data specialist within the industrial program, and I will be going through the industrial specific data dashboard. So the basic layout is pretty similar to what Amanda just discussed with you, um, but just focuses more on industrial demand um, specifically. 
So this first one here is industrial demand by subsector. Uh, you can see on the right it's broken up by facility types. These are the um, different facility types that we have within the industrial program. Um, so if you would like to filter for Santa Cruz and see specifically that data set, we have acre feet, acre feet broken up on the left here and then year on the bottom. And then, yeah, if you want to filter specific years, you can do that here. So you can see that you guys just have sand and gravel and turf facilities specifically. Um, yeah, and hover over to see more details on specific numbers in terms of acre feet or year. Moving on. This next one is industrial demand by supply source. So similar idea, just more focused on where the water is coming from specifically. Um, again, we have the facility typed on the left and we broke up turf into a little more detail for you guys. Um, so again, I'm gonna filter for Santa Cruz. Um, yep, years here on the bottom as well. Uh, yeah, and the different types of water broken out in the colors on the top here. Moving on, this next one is turf facility demand and allotment over time. So we have facility types, the different AMAs, and uh, whether or not they use groundwater. On the left, we have acre feet and year on the bottom. Um, and we have allotment quantity as this red line here, total use as this darker blue line, and then compliance use as this light blue line. Um, yeah, and facilities using groundwater and effluent will have the effluent use adjusted pursuant to the management plans for compliance purposes. So just yeah, more in depth on the compliance use there. And finally, just a page of definitions for quick and easy reference, if anything in here, uh, if you would like more information on anything there. So that is it for the industrial dashboard. I will now pass to Madison Marino for the municipal program dashboard. Thanks, Brad. Hi, members of the council and Mr. Chair. My, again, my name is Madison Marino. I'm the municipal data specialist and I will walk through the municipal dashboard with you today. This first slide of the dashboard is just a basic overview of all the municipal providers within all of the AMAs. And if you would like, you can search in this search bar for any provider within, um, if you know their name, or if you'd like to search by active management area, you can. This circle chart down at the bottom shows the supply by water type for the most recent reporting year, um, which is 2020. And if you hover over, it'll give you the exact percentage and the exact amount of acre feet of each water supply for that specific provider. Um, this line graph is the demand over time chart, and it shows data from 2000 to 2020. If you hover over the line, it'll also give you the exact acre feet for that year. On the second tab shows, there we go, shows the supply and demand um, in a more overview based off of small providers and large providers. So the default for this page is large providers and you can switch between the two by clicking these two tabs. And you can also narrow it down to go through Santa Cruz and see the water supply and demand over time between 2000 and 2020. These also can be taken down between Colorado River, which only applies to the supply over time. And you can also narrow it down by large conservation program, which also only works when you are on the large provider screen. This third tab is all about exempt wells within the active management area. At the top here, you could also narrow it down by AMA, select Santa Cruz, C the exempt wells. This top bar graph and line graph show the estimated well population with the estimated well population and the number of exempt wells. This bottom bar graph shows the estimated well volume pumped in acre feet from 2000 to 2020. On the fourth tab, the this is covering large provider conservation where you can also narrow it down between AMA, reporting year, and conservation program. 
Um, this donut chart here shows how many people are within each active or within each conservation program in each active management area. So if we go to Santa Cruz, you can see that if you hover over, there is one person or one provider in the GPCD program. This line graph down here shows the averages of the actual GPCD and the averages of the target GPCD. You can see there's discrepancy between the two. This top bar graph here shows the 10 most frequently implemented BMPs, which is associated with the non per capita program. And if you hover over, you can see the exact amount. This bottom chart here shows the loss net accounted for water through um, the percentage of each. So as you can see, green, good, in compliance. The red is kind of out of compliance, and those are providers working towards being in the green. The last page of the dashboard is just some municipal specific definitions. So I will pass it on to Kennedy. Thank you. I think that might actually be back to me. Uh, this is Natalie Mast again. Um, Kennedy, if we could go back to my slides. Um, we actually up next have Sandy Favorites. Uh, there we go. Um, so thank you, Amanda, Brad, and Madison. Uh, so up next, we do have Sandy who will provide some information on the fifth management plan mining proposal. We received this proposal for an alternative mining uh, program kind of late in the process, so we didn't get a chance to talk about it publicly. But uh, AMA staff saw it as a well-developed proposal, and we thought that it warranted some consideration. So since we didn't want to just include it in the plans without discussion, we saw the GUAC meetings as an opportunity to have a discussion about its possible inclusion in the fifth management plan. So with that, I will hand it over to Sandy. Thanks, Natalie. It's great to see everybody. Some of you for haven't seen you for a long time, so it's it's uh, really nice to to see some friendly faces. And I appreciate you your willingness to let us give this presentation. I'm just going to switch over. I'm going to take over sharing my screen and switch over to the presentation um, and. Please, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please don't hesitate to ask and we'll, we'll get through this. It'll be pretty quick, I promise. This, I should have been quicker. Let's see screen. Oh, there we go. Sandy, I, I got it. This is Mark Clark and I got a, a quick question. Uh -huh. Yeah, is the um, definition I see that this is for large scale metal mining is the definition of large scale also included in the old definitions dashboard like shallow and everything else is. I mean, what constitutes large scale versus not large scale and is, is that definition anywhere? I think the, the management plan really talks about pre 84 post 84 post 85 or right. something. Yeah, I saw yeah, that. I don't, Could, Natalie, you'll have to answer that. 84. I don't recall that, that there was a differentiation made between large scale metal mining. It was just metal mining. There, this is Natalie. There is a definition in the management plan for that. I um, give me a couple minutes to look that up and I can pop back in after Sandy's time. I, I don't need, I just was. Wondering if you know for down the road if if we've we've got that defined. It it so, is defined in the management. That's good. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you're you're asking me questions I can't remember. <laughs> Been a long time. Um, so we all get that way, and it's many <laughs> birthdays. There have been way too many birthdays, but uh, but but we're doing great, aren't we? Um, so the yeah. 
So my our proposal here is to um, talk about a an alternative conservation program for metal minings. And just to give you a little bit of background why this is, is something that Freeport felt was important, even albeit late in the process, but felt it was important to get into this process. You know, I need to give you just a teeny bit of background on Freeport's water stewardship and our strategy um, moving forward. You know, we, we really feel that effective water stewardship is it's, it includes maximizing water use efficiency, um, which is this what this is aimed at, as well as increasing and improving water reuse within our facilities, um, which is also a component of this draft program. Uh, we recognize, and this is something that we report out in our sustainability reports, I've worked really hard over the last few years to, to really help Freeport understand the, the value of water and, and, and how fundamental it is to, to everybody. I mean, it wasn't something that, that's not something I had to, you know, get across to them. I think, you know, everybody understands the value of water. Um, it was really sort of where we fit in that regional large scale picture and, and our ability as a company to really start setting the, setting an example for moving in a different direction than has historically been the case that sort of the easy, let's just drop a well and, you know, let's go. Um, so this, this program, as we, as we were looking at the management plan or management, the previous management plans, um, the, the program itself, See if I can get this to switch. The existing program, and pardon the numbers, but um, it really was focused on on tailings management. Um, there are there are conservation measures sprinkled in there for for other things in the mine, but really the the bulk of the program was focused heavily on tailings management. And um, you know, for those of you who don't know tailings, and in, in, I mean, you certainly have seen them driving down. Um, um, 19 as you're, you're going out past FICO or the, you know, the pecan groves, you, you see the tailings facilities, they look like mini mesas sort of off in the distance. And um, a lot of emphasis or a lot of real scrutiny has started to come on tailings management and how unique um, tailings are at each facility. And, and the, the focus and the scrutiny is really on safety. Um, there's been some recent um, situations in South America and, and in Canada where tailings facilities have have uh, failed, and it's ca caused just catastrophic damage to to those those areas. So we felt it was important to sort of get the focus off of tailings management as much as possible and really start identifying um, different approaches and, and more transparency in how the mines can actually conserve and reuse water within their, their facilities. Um, the objectives of the alternative mining conservation program really is that, you know, there are so many different activities going on in the mines. Um, you know, when I went over to Freeport, I was just, you know, it, I, my eyes were open too, you know, having not worked very much in the mining program at the department, but um, it, just just the amazing amount of water movement within those facilities and how water is being utilized. Um, the, there's just a substantial amount of water in the system that is evaporated um, because there's no program to really hold them accountable for. Um, in increasing the use of that water. And that's just Freeport's perspective. This is, you know, I've got to be very careful because other mining companies do things differently. And uh, because each mining company and each mine is, is, is very unique and very different, we felt that a, a best management practices type of program that, that really focused, allowed that mine to focus on how they're operating, um, how they're producing, you know, or, in, in our case, copper here in Arizona, um, we we built this program to um, to really focus on minimizing system and those evaporative losses that are occurring within the mines, and really focus on getting folks to not just put water to evaporation. That's not a management, you know, trying to trying to make that not a management objective, but let's utilize or reuse that water in a way that limits 
or reduces our consumptive use of native groundwater or surface water or CAP water. So really the, the, the big goal is not only to reduce overall water consumption, but to reduce our use of freshwater supplies, leaving those supplies available for local communities. Um, a significant part of that is also encouraging recycling and reuse of process water. Uh, we, we currently utilize a, a huge amount of our water, reuse a, a huge amount of our water. Some of our mines are, are actually reusing up to 80% of the original source, or uh, uh, they're reusing 80% of the total water use um, at the mine. And, and that really means that we can simply use those molecules over and over up to five times, you know, depending on the site, four or five times we're reusing those molecules. So there's a, already a lot of significant work that's been going on in the mines. It's just the programs don't really recognize that. And trying to make that more transparent for the public so that they can see what's, you know, what's going on and, and make it e more easy to understand the actual water conservation programs that, that we're that, that can be done within a mining facility. And, and really finally to promote the use of alternative water supplies. So, you know, our objective is to, you know, really reduce our groundwater use and by utilizing alternative water supplies. Um, this program is only a part of that, but you know, together um, maximizing efficiency and converting to alternative water supplies is really gonna go a long way in improving mining water use within um, throughout the state. Uh, the, our objective here as well is um, really this program, even though we're asking to put it in the management plans, you know, four of our five mines are sit outside of active management areas and we're already implementing this program at those mines uh, as well. So it's not something we're just trying to do in our Sierrita mine in the Tucson AMA, but we will be or have already implemented this program at, at our other operations, not only in Arizona, um, but in Chile and Peru and in New Mexico and somewhat in Colorado, their water rights structure is just a little bit different, but um, you know, that's, we're really going very aggressively and getting this program um, in place at those other operations. The program itself has, um, the following categories that where we've really focused on the BMPs and I'm, I'm sure you've seen the list of different BMPs that are, that are there and I'm not going to walk through every single one of them. I just wanted to highlight the categories. So dust control or dust suppression being a big one, our processing, our actual processing of the ore and rock and the conveyance of that. Um, there is, there are still components of tailing storage facility management, and that's really reducing the amount of water on those tailings facilities, which is really the safety issue. Um, reducing systems, so the, the infrastructure, the water infrastructure is just pretty crazy um, at some of these sites, but reducing system and evaporative losses within the facility. Focusing um, on improving cooling system efficiencies and thereby reducing the need for um, higher quality water supplies, and then uh, the final category of recycling and, and, and increasing the use of reclaimed water. That's really it in a nutshell. I mean, we can talk about any individual thing that you want, but I, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So with that, I will turn it over to Natalie for questions or however you wanna proceed. Okay, yeah, thank you, Sandy. Um, so, first of all, then I guess I'd ask um, the council, does anybody, um, I got a couple questions, but does anybody else on the council have uh, questions of uh, Sandy or of anybody here um, is, you know, on the fifth management plan? Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is Joel Kramer. I have a couple questions. Please. On page 77, of the plan, it's it's mentioned about the reclaimed water. It's bringing up uh, Palo Duro and Rio Rico Country Club, which both of those golf courses, as we know, no longer exist. So I'm wondering, do we really need to mention those golf courses since they are not golf courses anymore? Uh, thank you for that for that feedback. Um, we can we can double check that language there and uh, get that corrected. I appreciate that. 
Thank you. And I guess I have two more. One of them, I mean, it's not with the plan, but since I was looking at it and looking at the wells and private wells and the registry of wells, some of the wells that are registered there, I think they're probably old because one of them, as we know, Rio Rico Properties does not own the well anymore where the golf course or right along I-19, Mr. Jackson owns that, but it's still coming up as Rio Rico Properties. And a well right off of uh, one that I'm familiar with of over by Three Points South, where there used to be a missile base there. It said that's that's owned by the state of Arizona, which Pima County owns that. I'm just using those as two reference points, but I'm wondering if if that's good, going to be updated. Are are those well ownerships that are listed in the plan, or are you looking at our website? I was just looking at this the. I was referencing the plan then going into because the one was talking about wells. I just wanted to see the map and such and I started clicking on it and I was going, well, these aren't really updated. Okay, so the, the well ownership would have to be updated through our wells division. The, the website listings would have to be updated through our wells division um, by the new owners submitting a change of ownership. Uh, to our wells group, so those those things are kind of handled separately. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I hopefully that answers your question. But oh, yeah, it does. I just yeah again, and then the the recharge dashboard. We didn't touch on that. Is that and it said that's going to be updated by mid February. We we are oh sorry sorry to interrupt there, uh, member. We uh, obviously are running a little bit late on that. I actually have it. Open on my computer right now. I was working with our recharge group earlier this week to try to finalize that. We're hoping to have that out in maybe the next week or so. Oh, thank you. I'm just bringing what I saw. <laughs> As I spent a few hours this morning looking through things. Thank you very much, Chairman. I have a couple of questions that I may call, Mr. Chair. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about the the recharge in the Santa Cruz River that that we know is not the the traditional uh, deep aquifer that you can put the water and the water stays there for a long time, and uh, in the Santa Cruz. Sorry. Uh, on the Santa Cruz AMA, uh, you know that the water moves really fast. And uh, uh, and for years, we discussed that uh, maybe it was a good idea to allow some depletion on the aquifers to allow to have more space for recharge when uh, when the water, the storm water came in and, and recharged the, the basins along the river. And uh, and I don't know you have considered that in in the program, or with the traditional uh, aquifer recharge that you have in the rest of the EMAs. Uh, that's that's an interesting question, and um, Alejandro, uh, maybe we can chat another time because I hadn't heard. Um, uh, much of that that historical kind of strategy. That's I I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about um, what you're referring to there. Um, in uh, at a future GUAC meeting, we will talk a little bit more about um, the the safe yield report that I mentioned earlier, um, and we can um, maybe use a part of that conversation to to go into a little bit more detail about how we're looking at. Um, the goal of the AMA with regard to safe yield and also the portion of the goal that is related to um, preventing local water declines. Yeah, that was going to be my second question on, on the safe yield. How are you going to consider safe yield? Because the goal of the AMA is, I, I, if I remember correctly, it have been so many years, but if I remember correctly, is prevent long-term decline of the local water tables. And uh, and we discussed that for years. What's the long-term decline, and uh, and what's the local water tables, 
or if we allow decline in one uh, one area of the EMA, doesn't have any impact in the rest of the EMA. And uh, so those are uh, my questions. And the, the third one and the last one that I got is uh, because it's close to my heart right now, is the short water supply. How are we going to deal with the short water supply in the EMA uh, when uh, my understanding, we don't have rules yet for, for the short water supply and how we're going to deal with that in this management plan. And I'm talking about this because uh, the city of Magalhães has an application right now to renew the short water supply designation that we have. And uh, we're kind of struggling with that because uh, the ground water models that have been developed, uh, they needed to be updated. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, I have been waiting for almost uh, maybe more than 10 months to to get some some uh, answers. How are we going to deal with that? I have two consultants on hold to to deal with this uh, short water supply designation. And I know that they're extending the designation until we resolve those issues, but I want to resolve those before I die. <laughs> Thank you. So a couple of things there, um, obviously the assured water su supply rules are, are kind of outside of the authority of the um, management plans themselves. They, they do have to be adopted as a, a rule through uh, into the Arizona administrative code. Um, I, I, I guess at this point, I would just encourage you to uh, submit that comment in writing to the department, um, submit that feedback to our assured water supply group. Um, if you reach out to our assured water supply group, I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, schedule a meeting with you to talk through the status of your application as well. Um, I know they do that on a pretty regular basis, even when things are a little bit uncertain. So um, I, I know that's something that has been kind of a, an open question for, for the Santa Cruz AMA for a long time. And um, with current rule moratoriums in place, um, we just have not seen um, uh, too much of a push to go around the existing rule moratorium to get those Santa Cruz uh, shared water supply rules adopted. So so certainly submit that feedback if, if that's something um, that you we all have made in contact with everybody there, but uh, I just wanted to to see what impact that those issues would have in the in the management plan because I think they are kind of linked that uh, the safe yield and the short water supply has to be hand in hand. So I really think that I I don't know how the communication is going on internally in the department, but uh, uh, I remember we spent years discussing these issues for the third management plan and then for the fourth management plan went by and now we're in the fifth and uh, it's still not resolved. So I, in my opinion, uh, somehow needs to be addressed as a part of the management plan because the, the management plan is, is the, the whole thing for, for the AMA. The, the rest are little pieces that uh, uh, that's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, no, thanks Alejandro. And there's, I, I wanna talk to that a little bit when we do the uh, um, call to the council All, uh, also. Um, does anybody else have a, uh, um, anything, any, any questions for uh, the department on the fifth management plan? Okay, I just got a, a couple here also is one on the uh, um, uh, a question on the BMPs and I've participated a bit in the uh, with the subcommittee on AG on the BMPs and um, yeah, I mean there's they don't really apply down here. Uh, but the co consolidation of uh, IGFRs do you, for a landowner or, even a number of landowners to do something like that, uh, does, does is 
do they have to be part of the BMP program or is that, can that be separate? It, that is a totally separate program. That's a brand new thing for the fifth management plan. Um, okay. and, and the way the language is structured is that um, an owner or operator. So if, if there are multiple farms, even if there's um, different owners, if they're all operated under kind of an integrated farm unit, then they could um, potentially consider combining under that program. Okay. Um, the, the other question I have, and this goes to my uh, issues remarks in the, in the uh, introduction to the plan about uh, safe yield and on there, uh, how often are the, uh, I know the department's gotten back to, to uh, sounding uh, various wells in the, uh, in the AMA uh, periodically, but how often are those wells sounded? I, Kyle, do you know better than I do the answer to that question? I don't know off the top of my head, but I know they have a regular schedule where they're doing the, the, the well sweeps. But we can check with our field services team and get that information oh. to you. Uh, more okay, and, and is that going to be anywhere on the dashboard? We don't currently have like well depth to water or anything like that on the dashboard. Um, I believe there is an available web tool for our GWSI da database where you can see those types of things. Um, maybe, maybe we can pull a link to that for you guys and get that sent over. Okay. Mark, well, if I may, uh, I, I have seen that they have come to the AMA, uh, on a regular basis for the last, I, like every six months, uh, I have seen Mark Perez. I don't know if you remember him. He yeah. has come and, and do the survey, uh, here for our wells. He was here last week. So. Uh, I know that they they took the the uh, the measurements, so uh, I hope they continue with that. No, and I I know, and and uh, I I just had a client tell me that that I didn't know it was Mark was coming back and doing that, but that's um, um, that's good because he he knows the area. But I was just wondering, you know, how many wells are on that program? and you know how often it's done so um yeah if somebody could you know shoot that information out that would be good um okay if there isn't anything else i have one more question if i may sure it related to your question on the on the consolidation of the gfrs i'm a little concerned with that because i know some of the gfrs are in different locations through the AMA, if uh, you are going to consolidate in one area all the the water use, that would have a huge impact into that area and not having a, the the distribution that would be uh, if the consolidation was not in place. Like uh, I know that some are upstream from us and some are downstream from from the city of Nogales. When you consolidate, you can have a huge impact in, in the downstream users. Yes, I, I know. No, and and uh, I, you know, I, I don't based on sort of the distribution of, of the ag land. I I don't see that happening, but but it's something I I thought about when I looked at it. Is um, you know if if all the IGFRs are going to be, you know, pumped out of, of one area, say in Rio Rico, and they're going to grow rice or something like that, you know, I mean, that's going to make, um, that definitely is going to uh, make an impact. Um, but I think that's something, um, you know, I, I, at this point, I think that, that um, that would have to be addressed when it happened unless, um, you know, there's some sort of cautionary language in the, uh, in the management plan that makes it uh, conditional or allows other water users to, you know, put in some kind of input into that. And, um, you know, so they don't get left with a, a number of dry holes or something. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, I that's that's a really interesting um, point. So that was something that we did have some discussion about as we were developing that concept. Um, and I think we can be open to um, consideration of slightly customizing that program, the details of that program for the Santa Cruz AMA. In other AMAs, we had heard pretty significant interest in um, keeping kind of the geographic limitations broad there. So the way their language is written right now is that if a farm farms are in the same sub basin, then they can um, combine. But yeah. and um, sorry, go ahead. And we're pretty much well. We're we're pretty much all in the same basin. And, you know, we're not a broad plain here. We're a very sort of narrow strip on the on the ag land. Um, so it is, you know, we're not spread out on the top of a widespread aquifer. We're all, you know, sitting on a giant French drain. Yeah, um, I think the point. But that, but that, please oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I think I think the point that I would want to make there is that if you have suggestions on um, whether that language might be different for the Santa Cruz AMA, we're certainly open to hearing that. Um, for example, for the BMP program, um, farms have to be. Um, I think the language is contiguous or in close proximity instead of being allowed to be in the same sub basin. So. Right, so, okay. Um, okay, so 1 of the things um, I'm going to just make a call to the council. Uh, um, for anything this, um, you know, any sort of general comments on the plan or um, anything that uh, somebody wants to see the department. Uh, address at our at our next meeting. Okay, I got a few. Um, is uh, uh, one I would like uh, if we could. Well, I'll, I'll tell you why is I'm, I'm looking at, at some of the various water users and I thought about it when we talked about the mines and we don't have any any metal mining um, significant anyway in in this AMA we do have the potential for significant metal mining uh, upstream um, tributaries of the AMA um, you know in that that Harshaw and, and Lokeel mining districts that are out there uh, so um, one thing I would like to uh, see is and I, I kind of got a list of things here. Is one I would like um, if we could get a uh, they call it wildcat. It's not wildcat anymore. I can't remember the name out there. Um, but if we could get somebody from the mine to uh, come and uh, just uh, kind of you know meet with the the AMA at, at, at or the GUAC at the next GUAC meeting and just you know. Let us know kind of what their plans are, what their you know potential water use is, um, and bait, and also what their water disposal is going to be like, uh, since they are upstream from us. And it would be something I'd be willing to reach out to to them and ask them to come to a a, a meeting. Um, the other people who are concerned that I thought that it would be good if the uh, um, the council at large is gets familiar with this is in uh, like some of the things that uh, Alejandro brought up is if uh, you know I'd like Nogales and maybe also if uh, Liberty or whatever it is in Rio Rico now EPCOR um, to be able to reach out to them and just have them come to an AMA meeting and, you know, let us know, you know, what their issues are, if they're expanding their use, if they're not, um, just, you know, let us know what their issues are, what their um, problems might be, and whether the GUAC might be able to help them work any of that stuff out. Uh, the, uh, you know, and, and like I said, particularly, particularly Nogales would be a good one to do that. Um, we also keep talking about 
you know, and I've asked them a couple times, uh, John Hayes to come to these meetings and, and argue with all of us, but, uh, just, you know, to sort of give us an overview of, of what flood control is doing besides pestering people, because I'm sure they're doing something, something constructive somewhere. Um, and because of all that, I, uh, I would like the meetings, and I kind of want to see how the council feels about it. I'd like the next meeting and subsequent meetings to be in person. So I don't know how the department feels about that. They got to drive all the way down here to the border. And I'd like to know how the council feels about that also. Mr. Chair, I can provide the uh, department's position if you like. Sure. So we are, the department is planning to reopen our doors and re resume kind of normal operations the first week of April. After that, we are intending to transition back to in-person meetings. So it is our hope and our plan that our next meeting will be in person. Okay, great. Is there anybody on the council who just loves these, uh, uh, you know, Zoom meetings and, and never wants to walk out of their house again? Or is, is everybody okay with the- uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, this is Gary. I, I, uh, I think we're, at least speaking for myself, I'm, I'm anxious to get out and get back into regular meetings again. I've had about enough of Zoom, I think. Uh, so, and just one other thought, um, going back to the points we might like to cover in future meetings and given uh, Alejandro's advancing age, uh, maybe we could talk about the 100 year- <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The hundred, the hundred year um, <laughs> guidelines at some point. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's been, yeah, that that has been, you know, yeah, out there for a long time, and um, and and that whole slippery concept of of what's what is a decline and what isn't, what's a yeah. significant decline. And I know we kicked around ideas about how many standard deviations from the mean do we go to call something significant? And we, it's just been kind of park. We're, we're as confused as we were a decade ago. Yeah. So that would be good to start. Yeah, we, we got to start looking at that. Mr. Chair, members of the council, we would also like to have a, a fairly robust conversation on options with your water management assistance program fees at the next meeting as well. Okay. Just another thing I, that I'll add. I, I, can all, I can say what my thoughts are on that. Or I guess now they're not mine, they're my clients' thoughts, my various clients, but okay. <laughs> That would be good. And then, uh, um, yeah, oh, also, yeah, I, um, Alejandro, you, you brought up the, the uh, let's put that on there, some kind of thinking, because that's in, in some ways a, a, a best management tool that um, is, is maybe unique to this AMA and the idea of, of uh, you know, dewatering certain uh, basins at the, uh, you know, at certain times of the year. So um, let's, which of course would, would, you know, affect how, how long-term decline is measured or, or something like that. So um, if, uh, yeah, if, if, you know, if Nogales is doing anything or, wants to do something where they, you know, I don't know, dewater the micro basins and then rely on Potrero um, while waiting for those basins to fill back up again. Um, you know, that's, that's interesting. And, and I think it maybe is something that's, as far as the AMAs go, it's unique to the Santa Cruz AMA, that type of, of management. And it's, it's got risks to it, but I think it's, it's, also a, a fairly sound practice. So yeah, I'd kind of like to explore that a bit and, and be able to make it so that the city of Nogales could, could do things like that, would have the flexibility to do stuff like that without I, um, I have another one having it count I'll, against. 
uh, Mark. I, uh, yeah. I don't know if you remember that we discussed a lot of time the double double dipping of Rio, Rio Rico that now it happens. Uh, they sold the, the, the irrigation rights and they left the municipal demand in place. So they still Rio Rico is growing a lot more than anybody else in the AMA and uh, the potential to to impact the, the downstream users that doesn't impact the city but uh, everybody downstream from from Rio Rico may have a, a big impact by this double dipping that uh, uh, the rights that were supposed to be used for the municipal uh, development now they're getting used as for farming so I, I think we yeah. need to see what impact that's going to have. And, you know, yeah, the, yeah, because that that does, and, and well, you and I for sure know the uh, the history and the the various players on that one. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and and the the use that that has increased, um, yeah. We well, I, I think the first thing we need to do is, is is get a handle, and you might already know this is as for that entire what used to be all consolidated under Avatar, both the municipal and the ag, is now what is the total on that these days and that the you know that the ag right is being utilized and i'm with you i mean our you know our view was is that parts of the ag right have been shaved off to uh to handle you know for assured water supply for the utilities and then avatar sold basically sold a water right that didn't have as much water in it as they claimed when they sold it. So, yeah, that's um, an issue. And, and I, I think one of the things that we do need to get a handle on is, is you know, what's, what's the total use of that, that area now? It's, um, you know, Rio Rico Plus. Is that still Liberty? Do they still call themselves Liberty out there? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's Liberty. Okay, yeah, and I know they're, you know, they're um, not so much their service area, but I think their their hookups. My understanding is, you know, their hookups are expanding, and their their water use is going to be expanding, and so is the ag use as those guys have reclaimed a bunch of that that ag land. Um. So. Yeah, well, that's definitely going to be a. a an issue, um, you know, if and, and that would be something that the department from their records could could look at is because we um, you have the the reports from uh, both the IGFR reports uh, out of Rio Rico and the uh, uh, municipal reports from Liberty out of there, and then. Uh, if we can look at it and what the the sort of recent water use is um, out of there, and that would include, I guess, on the IGFR is stuff that that Andy Jackson is is because uh, um, he he's bought a, uh, you know in various years he's he's augmented you know tried to um, get some of some extra water through uh, um, buying uh, credits from. Uh, you know, from the neighbors and I mean, which he can, he can do that's for sure. But that, um, you know, and that, that would be marked on the use. So yeah, if we could get just the, um, the water budget uh, from those two entities out of, uh, you know, to just sort of, so that, you know, we can look at it. I don't know what, if anything we could do about it or what even, um, the law would be authorized to do anything about it. You know, I hate to beat up people who are 
um, in sort of good faith thought they had water and don't. But uh, um, but it is something like Alejandro said is is uh, you know that's uh, that affects everybody, particularly everybody downstream. So if, yeah, if we could get those numbers from the department through the reports and just see, and, and I don't know if the department's got a policy about disclosing individual um, uses on there, you know, the amounts of individual uses. I don't think they do, but uh, um, they might. But anyway, that would be something we'd like to see is, is you know, how much, how much water that area is using at, at this point. And Mr. Chair, this is Kyle. Um, so annual reports are a public record, but uh, I will give you uh, or maybe Alejandro a call to talk about this to just make sure we're looking for the right information before we start any work there, but we can send out some uh, information for you guys. The, the reason for my, okay. my suggestion is that uh, I guess on the, on the management plan for downstream users for physical availability, you may have all the water and paper, but uh, basically may not be there. So I think it's important for the management plan to reconcile the two things, the paper water and the physical water that may be available. Oh yeah, and that's been, um, how long have we had this argument with the lawyers, Alejandro, about real water versus paper water? It's, um, but you're right, and particularly as, as maybe assured water supplies get get rolling again as people start, you know, um, applying more for those is, is, yeah, physical availability is, is going to be key because we all know that as far as paper rights, um, we've got, you know, almost more water here than goes down the Colorado River. Yeah, you have 900,000. Uh, acre feet claim, you know, five, 500. I only got 500 or my, my form, my clients now have 500 <laughs> on a claim, okay. 500,000. Uh, that. Yeah. Well, you know, it all depends how you count a miner's inch. <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, but yeah, that's something we do have to look at and, and we, we definitely parked it for a while because uh everything was rolling around okay but uh so we we need a client who's got lee story as their lawyer and they can come back in here so okay um okay so let me ask if if uh, as far as the next meeting these are all things we we would like some are informational some would be up for just discussion as we go forward and figure out how to fit in the uh, the fifth management plan and how we're going to live with it, and it it doesn't have a you know savage impact on Santa Cruz County, but uh, it, as far as I can tell, um, uh, I would be interested to know what the uh, you know the potential silver mine guys are are doing, and um, I think we're better off having conversations with them at the front end rather than uh, uh, down the road. And, um, but same also with any of the, the municipal water providers, uh, you know, if they're having any issues and, and stuff like that, I, I hear about the, the ag issues pretty much, but the municipal stuff, if, if those guys are having any issues, it would be nice if they could, you know, bring them to the, the GUAC and, and um, you know, just so we can be a little more sort of efficient in this area of, of what we're doing. Um, anyway, with that said, what, um, you know, do we have any public out there? I'd make a call to the public. I'm public. Oh. Wait, you're public? Yeah. Yeah. Who are you? This Ben. Oh, Lomely. I'm here. I've been yeah, here. Yeah, okay. Been oh, here. Okay. Good enough. 
So, um, okay, you got um, you got anything going, Ben? I well, I sent you a couple of things in the chat box. Oh, okay. Well, I you, I don't see anything on my oh. screen. I have a big white screen here that doesn't get anything. So. Um, yeah, if anybody from DWR or any, uh, can look at the chat box and, um, see what, you know, answer, answer Ben's questions. Well, it's comment period, right? Yeah. Well, I had comments rather than questions. Oh, well, okay. Shoot. Give us, give us your comment. Thanks. All right. Uh, you can also ask Para on a presentation about the concerns on South 32 mine dewatering. They, they've done a lot of work and uh, they've got some experts working and presenting on it. So, and they're presenting to the town of Patagonia as well. So they have presentations ready. So that way, okay. That way you can have a balanced, uh, you know, have the mine people there, but also have a presentation by those that are concerned about the mine. Okay, and when you say para, who who do you, oh, that's you mean? Patagonia Area Resource Alliance, and Carolyn Schaefer is the contact there. Oh, okay, okay, and I know her. So um, the, um, the other comment, Mark, was uh, on Ephraim Canyon Flood Control Basin that has been funded. I understand that they're. I think they're just waiting for matching funds. And uh, the plans are ready, and John Hayes is we, the contact on that. Okay, we, we, which one is that? Where is that one at? That's Western, Western Avenue, Avenue in Nogales. Yeah, that Western Avenue ab above the hospital. Oh, okay. That one has a historic oh, okay, flooding. Okay, yeah. And, you know, the little border wall broke down there once and let a bunch of water through that neighborhood. And, uh, there's a school there and multiple families and so it's a high risk area that a flood control can address with that you, you don't base enough you, you're talking about all of the western all of all of the western wash is the high risk area yeah i'm talking from or, border or the area the freeway on down through allers wrecking yard and on down to yeah yeah Auto hotel there and, and John Hayes has been the lead on that, and I think he's got some funding now. Okay. That's it. Um, okay. Good enough. And, um, uh, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to call John and just see what, yeah, if he wants to, to come and talk about that. Um, just which would be good i'll call he'll he won't take my call because he's afraid i'm going to yell at him for something but but this would be this would be a nice friendly call okay um okay and thanks ben and i'm, I'm glad you showed up oh and i might as well ask you are you good with in-person meetings Who's that? I'm, I'm asking Ben Lomely if, if if he's good with. Um, I know he's, he's not on the council, but he's he's there pretty much all the time. So is is he okay with the? Um, is he looking forward to getting back to in person meetings? Yeah, long as nobody teases me about my long hair because I haven't been to the barber since COVID started. Ah, oh, for God's sake! You got a beard too. You're probably looking like Santa Claus. Uh, yeah. You know, and and the plan set to go with it. Yeah, I'm good with in person. <laughs> in person meetings. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. So, it, um, is there anybody Mr. Chair, else this out is there? Kyle. Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to give Natalie an opportunity to talk about next steps before we end the meeting. So. Please continue oh, okay, with your sure. call to the public, but after that, I'd like to let her explain some of what's coming next. Okay. I think the public's down, so yeah, if we could, um, one, talk about the next meeting date and also kind of the schedule um, for, the, uh, um, uh, for the comments on the fifth management plan. 
or further comments, I guess I should say, in the fifth management plan. So please. Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Kennedy. Um, so I know we covered a lot of management plans information here, uh, but I did want to share just a little bit of information on the next steps. Um, we do appreciate your questions and comments today. Um, what you can see on the screen here uh, shows the statutory language related to the GUACs. Um, so that statute indicates that GUACs are to comment to the area director and to the director on draft management plans for the active management area before they are promulgated. So ultimately, the purpose of this presentation is to provide a baseline of information to allow for those comments. And, and again, I do appreciate the the discussion and the questions uh, that have occurred so far today. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so we are in the light blue section of this timeline that you see on the screen. Um, after today, we will be working to update the draft plan in response to comments. Um, and then we will be working to prepare for the promulgation or the legal adoption of the 5MP for each of the five AMAs. Um, the promulgation process is defined in statute and also includes a comment period beginning on the day the promulgation order is issued and the hearing is announced and it ends at 5 p.m. on the date of the hearing. Um, during that formal comment period, anyone can submit comments in writing during that time period um, or they can provide verbal comments at the hearing. Um, after the hearing, ADWR will issue findings from the hearing and uh, may decide at that time to adopt the plan. Uh, when the plan is adopted, we will send out a notice of conservation requirements to all regulated parties. And uh, assuming we meet our timeline of sending those notices in 2022, the uh, conservation requirements in the plan will become effective on January 1st, 2025. Um, I do want to emphasize the importance of the timeline here. In 2018, the Auditor General did issue a report directing ADWR to complete and promulgate the fifth management plans. So it's really important that we meet this timeline of adopting those plans by the end of the year so that those requirements become effective on January 1st, 2025. Um, in terms of next steps for, for you all specifically, um, we have laid out kind of a tentative schedule for how we will um, stagger those promulgation processes throughout the year. Um, we did have Santa Cruz right now toward the end of that process, so we do have a few months here before um, we will begin the promulgation process for the Santa Cruz AMA. Um, but that said, we are um, kind of trying to um, match up the various AMAs as, as much as possible. So uh, if the GUAC members do have um, additional questions or comments, I would really encourage you to email those to uh, me or Kyle um, uh, as soon as you possibly can um, within the next few weeks here in order that we can start, um, considering those reaching back out to you if you have, we, if we have questions, um, and getting those incorporated into the plan ahead of the hearing. So, uh, with that, um, if there are ad any additional questions, um, I would be glad to take those or, uh, I can hand it back to Kyle to talk about the next meeting date. Okay. And you know, one thing I, I'd ask is is anybody on the GUAC who uh, um, you know wants to put in these um, comments or suggestions or anything like that. You know, it'd be really helpful if when you do it, if you copy copy the other members. It's it's not. I think we can do that without violating any kind of open meeting laws or anything like that. But just um, you know, copy the other members or if you don't have their emails or something like that, if uh, if the department, any questions that come, come from, from GUAC or anybody in the, the Santa Cruz AMA, if you could just, you know, kick those out, those questions, forward them on to, uh, um, you know, to the, the uh, other GUAC members 
here in, in SCAMA. Uh, you know, one, so we're not like asking you a lot of repetitive questions, but also to sort of to keep us um, keep us as individuals up as, as to what uh, what people are thinking out there. That would be that would be real helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll I'll let Kyle speak to any open meeting law considerations there. But I did just want to give you a heads up as well that we do post any written comments that we receive on our website under that draft management plan. So, okay. so any any written Thanks. comments we receive are available on our website as well. Thanks. And Mr. Chair, this is Kyle. I would just discourage uh, discussion of of these topics in more than parties of two, just so that we don't right. have of any of the open meeting. Right. And, and I was going to say it's it's not a um, you know it wasn't so much for discussion as it more like food for thought for the next meeting is all so. Um, okay. And um, so, Kyle, you got anything on the next date? Yeah, so Kennedy and I were just chatting a little bit uh, during that discussion about what, what looks good for us. We are heading right into our kind of peak busy season with annual reports and data entry and the legislative session and all that. So, we were thinking maybe sometime in July would be best for us. Does that work for? Members of the council. Um, yeah, July's good. I, uh, you know, I'm happy to do them more frequently. But but July, like you say, you guys are liable to be tied up. So July might be just fine. Okay, we can shoot for late June, early July, if that makes sense for everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's do that. Okay. Okay, and so we can uh, look at some dates in that time period and Kennedy will send out a doodle poll um, so we can get a date finalized. Okay, great. Does anybody have anything else? Okay, in that case, um, do I hear a motion to adjourn? I move. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. And all in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Just like a pirate. Aye. Okay. Thank um, you. So, meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care.